David Waldman. All right. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Wednesday, January 11th, 2023. Time for another show, et cetera, et cetera. Looks like the bus is arriving and the high schooler is, should be out there and waiting. All should be well today, but uh, what a week. Holy mackerel. All of a sudden, everything in the world is due all at once. And uh, all of my own uh, you know, anxieties about school have come flooding back, as frequently happens when you have kids who are facing their own anxieties about schools. Although, he's, uh, he's a cool customer. He doesn't seem to uh, really reflect that anxiety. I don't know. So it may all be in my head, but there seems like there's an awful lot of things due, and uh, I feel the pressure, and I I, mm, I, don't, I don't like that a whole lot. I feel like my pressure from school should be done already, but uh, looks like I have a few more years ahead of me. So, all right. Well, that's not the chief on your list, I'm sure. Lots of other things probably occupying your mind at the moment. Greg Dworkin is preparing a raft, owe them, for you to, uh, well, to... For him to share with you and for you to have them shared with you. You don't have to do anything. The pressure is off of you. You just get to listen. All the pressure is on us and really on him because, uh, you know, that's the way it is. We've transferred that pressure to him. Lots to cover. Uh, I have a number of things lined up. Of course, there are um, a few interesting breaking stories that I don't know have any uh, necessarily, well, not yet any political bent to them, but uh, it's still early, and there's certainly time for Republicans to invent a reason why this is the fault of Democrats. But apparently, uh, flights across the country, if you're a pilot, for instance, and you're listening to the show, it's probably fine. You're not late for your flight because all flights have been grounded, or at least uh, I don't know exactly what that means. Because when I heard that, I, I turned on the Flight Aware app, that tracks flights all over the country. And I sometimes use, uh, sometimes uh, for uh, tracking when relatives are on flights somewhere and I can see how they're doing and getting to their destination or whatever. Uh, Sometimes you can use it to track private jets flying all over the place. Elon Musk hates that. I haven't done that, but I'm sure that's what other people are doing. Uh, But when you turn it on, you can see, basically you can look at the map, the radar map and see all the planes in the air. And there are always a lot. So I thought, oh, interesting. I'll turn it on and take a look and see what it looks like when all the flights are grounded. And you know what? It looks like none of the flights are grounded. So I'm not really sure what's going on. Maybe I guess they started to hold flights and said, starting at X time, don't take off. But, you know, there's always a lot of planes in the air. But anyway, that's the news. Apparently, they've had some sort of breakdown of the computerized system by which they control air traffic. No indication so far, as far as I can tell, either from uh, the morning radio reports or from this New York Times blurb uh, or write-up that I've got on it, says uh, no evidence of a cyber attack, just plain the goddamn thing don't work, and now everybody has to wait until it does. So uh, we'll update that situation, I guess. If there's news, uh, the latest update about 20 minutes ago in the New York Times saying that the agency, that being the Federal Aviation Administration, was making progress in restoring its system. That's good. So, you know, the old computer fix. You, uh, have you tried turning it off and turning it back on again? They turned it off and uh, now it's taking them some time to turn it back on again, I guess. So as of 9 a.m., uh, it said the FAA was expecting departures to resume at 9 a.m. Eastern time at most airports. So that's good. But like I said, I got up and, you know, 730 or so and checked and it looked like it was no different from any other day. There are just already a lot of planes in the air. Whether they were flying around blind, I couldn't tell you. But OK, that's a major piece of news. I don't know whether there's any, uh, pardon me, any more to it or anything, but uh Yeah, we'll keep an eye on it. And uh, I'm sure, like I said, Republicans will find some way to uh, blame this on, I don't know, CRT somehow. And uh, maybe that's it. The cathode ray tubes that they're looking at uh, to see where the blips are on the radar 
are the ones that were not working. I'm sure they can blame it on that. Uh, meanwhile, in other areas of the news, I also note for the record, I just, uh, I'll have to follow this one up and see what I can find. Perhaps while the raft of stories is floating down the river, the, uh, Little bit of interest that I saw from Stephen Dennis, who I mentioned yesterday, so he gets two mentions in a row on the show tracking this one, um, or at least uh, pointing out that it is a story that apparently, um, maybe as part of the rules package and part of the, we didn't actually see. I'm trying to think of where would they have hidden this, but uh, they changed the rules for reimbursement from official funds taxpayer funds, essentially, for members of Congress while they are in D.C. It used to be the case, basically, that, uh, you know, you got your $174,000 salary, which, you know, used to go a lot further, I'm sure, as uh, all people, everyone's complaining about inflation, etc. Uh, you know, and it was always an odd thing to stand there and complain about. I mean, there was an awful lot of power that went with the job, plus 174 is a pretty good salary. But anyway... Uh, out of their $174,000 salary, they did have to pay some extraordinary expenses. Uh, and while their travel to and from Washington, D.C. to their home districts is covered, and you would think that would be the major expense, their housing and meal costs while in D.C. were not. But you had $174,000 to play with, but that had to cover your housing costs both at home and here in D.C. And, uh, well, it was always supposed to cover your food, no matter where you are. But, you know, they're very busy much of the day. Uh, not easy to, say, uh, bag lunch and then go home and uh, cook to save money. So a lot of dining out for some very vi- busy people. And I guess they've changed the rules. And now you can get reimbursement not only for meals while you're in D.C., but for your lodging as well, which also means that instead of trying your best, if you wanted to, you know, make it work on a budget, finding an apartment, et cetera, et cetera. You can, you can just stay in a hotel every single day that you're in Washington, D.C., which is most of those days, and get it paid for by the taxpayers. And that's a, that's a huge change, and it'll put, a, it'll put an awful lot more money in their pocket. Uh, but I, I worry that it will also lead to, well, you know, it'll lead to uh, some abuses as well. But though... Donald Trump has gotten rid of his hotel, so I don't know how they're going to use this to bribe Donald Trump anymore. I think those days might be over, and you can't stay in Mar-a-Lago and do your work in Congress, so there's no way for him to funnel that money to to Trump. That's a major step forward, but uh, it will relieve a lot of pressure for a lot of lawmakers, but I think it will also lead to a lot of uh, uh, Republicans staying in the Ritz-Carlton all the time. Or the four seasons and billing the taxpayers for their for their meals. So we'll see how that works out. Greg Dworkin is here and uh, nobody's paying him uh, to do anything, as much less stay in the four seasons. I'm sorry to say, uh, but but you're here out of the goodness of your heart, and that I understand you'd probably go crazy if you didn't get a chance to vent. So good morning. Good morning. So the the ground stop has been lifted. Good. That's, that's the official word from the difference. FAA. So. As of nine o'clock, this show can fly. Here we go. Here we, we believe go. it anyway. I'm old enough to remember when a lot of the freshmen would like uh, room together or or yes. rent uh, uh, basement apartments from the senior people. Uh, right, they did do that. Or uh, then then the the later trick was I'm going to just sleep in my office. Yeah, but yuck. But. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, they do. They did do that. And But uh, nowadays you just write it off and then use the money you were given for housing and you can invest it in Bitcoin? Is that how it works? Yeah, now? pretty much. I guess so. You can do whatever you want with it. But uh, yeah, now it looks like you'll be able to just uh, put yourself up in a hotel and say, you know, the Treasury will pay for that. Yeah, okay, good. Which is, uh, that's actually kind of a real big throwback. They used to stay in hotels way back. That's where the lobbying came from, the, all the uh, work that was done in the lobby of the hotel. Now we're talking like 1800s, though. Right, but, you know, uh, the, then they had the a war. Yeah, living terrible. together as uh, poor uh, freshman house members meant yeah. you bonded. That's I true. I mean, theoretically, you could even, uh, you know, share housing with somebody from the opposite party and actually talk to them every once in a while. Oh, my, no way. But uh, that used to happen. 
Um, they tended to gravitate towards the members of their own sure, party. Sure, but certainly, I mean, but, but if like things are super expensive, you got to do what you got to do. Yeah, and when it was renting a basement apartment and it was an you know actual apartment, it didn't really matter who was living upstairs. So there was a little cross aisle cross pollination going on there. And kids these days, they just don't yeah. know. Right. Well, ever since they stopped carrying canes and beating one another with them, there's some up, there's some down. You know what I'm right. saying? So there's a whole bunch of different topics. I don't know that we're going to spend like 45 minutes on one. Maybe we will because it gets Hmm, interesting. But uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff. The topic of today's Pundit Roundup is uh, Kevin McCarthy's problem-causing caucus (laughs) is uh, just getting warmed up. (laughs) Okay. Well, that's what they are. Yeah, it's a good title. They're the problem-causing caucus. So uh, this was a piece in the Washington Post, which I thought was sort of interesting. And, of course, talks about the fact that – they're a pugilistic bunch. Oh, yes. Um, but of mm, top concern to several Republicans is the motion to vacate provision in the rules package, which we've yeah. talked about a lot. Right. What I thought was interesting is that when McCarthy was making concessions, first he said, we'll never move on this. And then it was OK, but you need five. And then it was OK, but you need one. Yes. Well, you the current one, rule right? actually allows anybody, including a Democrat, to call for a motion to expel the speaker. All right. Then I will. All right. And yes. the rule has been in place for more than a century. And here's the part I found interesting. Its impact was tested by Democratic leader Nancy Pelosi and Republican leader John Boehner over the years, who had an understanding that they wouldn't interfere in each other's leadership battles, including on the motion to vacate. To protect the institution, according to three people familiar with the decision who spoke on the condition of anonymity to discuss private conversations. So that would be Pelosi, Boehner, and I don't know, maybe Pelosi's daughter, Christina, knows a lot. Hmm. Uh, But uh, they didn't say that. I'm just guessing. Uh, I'm um, uh, needlessly speculating, baselessly speculating. But, you know, people who knew said that's what they did. And then the Washington Post, in its understated fashion, goes on to say, and this is the part I found amusing, Mm -hmm. no such understanding is expected between (laughs) McCarthy and Hakeem Jeffries. Yes. And that's true. There will be no such understanding. I don't see when they would have had time to reach such an understanding, much less. And Tony Gonzalez, who Mm -hmm. voted against the rule package and was the only Republican that did in the end, said uh, that's one of the reasons. He was concerned about defense betting and he was concerned about this provision. Okay. So he sounds like like a normie, weird, like a normal Republican. So weird. There's like only one of them. So mm. if you were wondering how many moderates there really are in the Republican Party in the House, the answer is one. I guess so. And if you were wondering whether that overlaps with the stories they keep trying to push that, oh, all uh, the uh, the Hispanic community is uh, making moves, gravitating towards the right in their voting habits. Uh, if if that's the case. Uh, they're not going MAGA, but, mm. uh, well, one guy anyway. <laughs> well, we'll see about the rest of the entire Hispanic voting block or whether we can read it off of one guy. So uh, Republicans will also create a new select subcommittee under the Judiciary oh, Committee. By the way, that'll be chaired by uh, Jim Jordan. Yes. That will investigate what they are describing as the weaponization of the federal government. In effect, it's the Donald Trump Defense Fund. I don't yes, know what they're going to call it. Right. I don't know how they're going to describe it. But in fact, not in theory, what it will be is whoever investigated Donald Trump will be subject to investigation by our committee. That's what it amounts to. In the rules, they actually – that's the name they give it. But uh, they, I guess, have an opportunity to give it a different name in, in the resolution that actually creates it. Uh, and, although I guess the – well, I guess the rules did create it. But I guess they could rename it. But right now they're actually using the – subcommittee on you know weaponization of the federal government which who even knows what that means right the um the use of it uh is going to be interesting in terms of uh how they go about doing that because one of the uh groups one of the clubs Mm. one of the uh interest caucuses that tends to investigate donald trump is the department of justice yes and so under their rules, That's usually... how this legislative body attempts to attack an executive uh, club yeah. that has secrecy as part of what they do, it's going to be really interesting to see how that plays out. Yes. Well, I think their thinking is 
uh, we may ruin a number of investigations or taint a number of investigations by demanding information that should not be released to us. And then if we taint it, then they'll end up having to drop the charges. Right. That's their hope. That's their hope. But uh, at the same time, they don't really care about that. That's merely a, uh, a, a tactic ah, to yes. get to their strategy. Right. And the strategy is re-election. And yes, when they do stuff true. like that, it hurts their chance of re-election. And that's the part of it I don't get. Hmm. I mean, people don't like that. The the 2022 electorate rejected the most extreme of the extreme parts of what they're trying to do. And as a matter of fact, there is a, a, a Tom Etzel piece about that, uh, which I don't know if I sent it to you. I really should. If I didn't, I will. Well, I'm going to investigate why you didn't. Uh, exactly. Uh, and this is uh, mine that you did. called uh, Meet the Republicans. We're facing down the hard right. And they're not talking about the House where well, that's not they're happening. They're not facing down the hard right. No. They're talking about the states. Oh. Hello. For example, um, Republican-controlled South Carolina House of Representatives in this former Confederate state where Republicans hold 88 former. of 124 seats in the House of Representatives. The party's contemporary mainstream has faced challenges from the party's hard right. And instead of exceeding, South Carolina Republicans did an interesting thing. I wrote, did an interesting thing. I said it's, that. That's not uh, that's all. What Edsall said is they turned the tables and demanded that the 19 members of the South Carolina Freedom Caucus abide by a set of rules prohibiting them from campaigning against fellow Republican incumbents mm -hmm. or violating the confidentiality of discussions among closed meetings of Republicans. Refusal to sign on to these rules, which Freedom Caucus, that South Carolina Freedom Caucus, members have attacked as a loyalty oath, <laughs> would it prohibit is. Republicans in the State House from membership in the South Carolina Republican Caucus, effectively relegating them to legislative marginalization. So it's it's a caucus mm. rule. It's not a House yeah, rule. Sure. So you don't have to worry about what the Constitution, the South Carolina Constitution says about it. It's got nothing to do with that. They might not even have one. I don't know. Clubs can make their own rules. Uh, yeah, that's uh, true. It's interesting that they did that. Uh, I don't know why they think they're a former Confederate state. They're still pretty Confederate, but okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so far, 71 Republicans have signed the rules and 17 haven't. So they they picked off at least two members. <laughs> well, that's something. Well, they, they're not done yet. Maybe they'll pick off a bunch of others. All right. Tony Gonzalez right? could be And uh, uh, Edsel notes that that's a out of view, out of sight, out of mind sort of battle. Yes. That... Uh, it's in South it's Carolina. actually being won by the normies. Then there's Ohio. That's a little bit more public. Uh, Derek Marin, hard-edged anti-abortion conservative, supportive of so-called right-to-work laws, assured victory in his bid to become Speaker of the Ohio House of Representatives. Hmm. And when the full Ohio House met to pick a Speaker, Marin was defeated. Hey, by, what do you know? A bipartisan coalition of 32 Democrats and 22 Republicans. Wow. They supported a less conservative, less confrontational Republican, Jason Stevens. I thought hmm. that Upton had a chance in the House because these things actually happen. Yes. I mean... I thought there was more Tony Gonzalez's. They there. happen in the states, and there were several, and there still are several, but yeah, yes. I don't know. It's Pennsylvania a, was another one. Alaska right. was another one. So he, he, he cites all these things. It's real. And it's real. And so uh, it could happen. Uh, and... Uh, in terms of recent developments at the state level, two Republican pollsters, Ed uh, Gaze, is that goes? Oh, G O E A S. I never figured yeah. out how he pronounced. I've, been, I've interviewed him. Oh, <laughs> have you? Figured out how he pronounced his name. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't it was know. in Gaze, Geis, 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 Geis. Gers. I think it was Gaze. Who recently Guggenheim. retired as president of Terrence and Neil Newhouse, who does public opinion strategies, have substantially Newhouse. different interpretations. In a phone interview, Gase argued that both parties have allowed their respective primaries to be dominated by the most ideologically extreme voters. Gase is the more ideologically extreme of those pollsters, by the way, oh. with the result that the two parties are failing us because they've allowed general elections to become contests between candidates who represent the far right and the far left, you know, like Joe Biden. Uh, yes, Andrew Cuomo. I'm, I'm thinking of all the Democrats who are like far left. Yeah, they're crazy. Yeah. Because of this, Gaze, uh, that's satire, by the way. None of these mm, guys are far yes. left. Because of this, uh, 
uh, gays contended, my sense is people are ready and willing to return to more normal politics. Newhouse wrote, though, the trend is less to do with the GOP reading tea leaves from voters calling for more moderation and more to do with legislators' own self-preservation. Seems mm, to be little sure. to indicate this extreme polarization is likely to improve in the near future. We may not have reached bottom. But things happen, and the electorate has a way of uh, uh, having the last say on these things. Uh, this is a piece from Jeff Singer from our uh, Daily Cost Elections group. Uh-huh. Democrats kick off 2023 special elections with a monster red to blue flip in, uh, wait for it, Virginia. Yay. Yes. A little now, further south, but all right. Tur- well, but the thing is, the state Senate, which uh, represents all of Virginia. Right. The whole thing. Even here. Was destined to be 2119 with 21 Democrats and 19 Republicans. And while that may sound like a thin but and, and marginal but uh, nonetheless Democratic uh, advantage, it did. there's a Republican governor, a Republican lieutenant governor who breaks ties. Mm. And one of those Democrats is a conservative Dem whose name is Joe Morrissey. Oh. I don't know that much about Joe Morrissey, but yeah, he's a self described, quote, unapologetically pro life democrat okay i get that so in a 21 19 democratic majority joe morrissey gets to be joe manchin and gets to be the tiebreaker because if he votes with the republicans on any given issue instead of 21 19 it's 2020 that is a tie the tie is broken by the republican lieutenant governor winston sears and that means that uh, banning abortion was on the table Yes. Well, you have to frame everything in terms of abortion. Like, uh, should we uh, allow abortion of uh, these income taxes right But here? what happened no, is that uh, Virginia Beast Councilman Aaron Rose, yes. who is a ex-footballer, oh, are you, like, beat uh, Kevin Adams, the... who is an ex-Navy guy. Okay. So, I mean, this is, uh, you know. Sense or... What's that? I mean, he actually played professional football. All right. So an American footballer. So the thing is, uh, you know, so, you know, you got these uh, uh, testosterone guys running. Yeah. Awesome. And uh, our our guy beat their guy. Yay. And so uh, banning abortions off the table for Virginia, at least for a year. And who would have thought that the uh, big, tough football guys would be the ones uh, concerning themselves with this? Thank God they are. Uh, okay. Who who would beat up the Navy guys on this? Well, the uh, Army guys thought that. It, well, oh, yes. That, they may have thought that. The That's significance, true. though, uh, and I'm, the reason I mentioned Navy yes. is because we're talking about Virginia Beach. Right. This is Navy territory. Beach, water, water, Navy. Get it? Uh, yeah. You know, naval that, bases. That's really true. Area. Yeah, one of the it's the biggest uh, one well, one of the biggest military installations. You're talking Newport News, area. Virginia Beach, in that area. It's, the whole thing. Uh, it's uh, semi-conservative, at least in that regard. Um, and you know, it, uh, it's always about turnout. But you know, I just think it was interesting. And then what's going to happen at, at the uh, since it's Daily Coast elections and they look at this stuff. The contest took place under the old lines for the 7th District, a seat that neither party had a firm hold on. While the district moved hard to the left during the last presidential election, you know, like a one-point lead for Hillary Clinton turned into a 10-point lead for Biden. Republican Glenn Youngkin took it 52-48. And then the new redistricting area is going to be the 22nd. It's not going to be the 7th anymore. And uh, that was a 20-point victory for Biden. Okay. So uh, the Democrat who won is going to have an easier time to win in November. All right. And it will be November because it's Virginia and you guys do everything on the off years. Right. So we'll start all over again and uh, we'll be. So he'll only more, be in that seat for a days. little while, but a good chance of making it, uh, you know, semi-permanent full term for hmm. himself. And uh, that's significant. So, you know, again, this is an area which is a marginal seat in the sense that uh, it's not marginally important but it's marginal in terms of uh, the margin being very small typically for whoever wins Mm. and uh, if i'm not mistaken uh uh, whoever the uh jen i forget her name kiggins uh who uh went on to defeat elaine luria oh in virginia too in the new virginia too um, Jen Kiggins gave up the seat. Hmm. So it went from Republican to Democrat. 
And uh, my point is that, uh, you know, if you think abortion didn't matter because like it's over and it was all over uh, hyped and, you know, the abortion thing really, I mean, that's what the Republicans wanted you to believe in 2022. It yes. mattered. It still matters. It mm -hmm. mattered in this district, and it was probably the reason why the Democrat won. These Republicans don't seem to have a great grasp of what wins elections. It's right. Odd. And so we go back mm -hmm. to what I was saying about, well, you See? know, you have a, a hard right, and they're very happy that they can celebrate their hard right, hard right victories. Oh, you had it right. But, but that only... Uh, that only lasts for so long and then uh, catches up with you. Yeah. I mean, I guess they – I'm sure they're looking at it from the perspective of uh, – I don't understand. People are telling us uh, that uh, we we lost a lot of uh, power at the polls because we've been advocating for things people don't like. But we have a majority and we didn't used to. So that's a win. So they're wrong. We're right. And uh, we should plow ahead as opposed to – you know, what usually happens if Democrats are in that spot, of course, well, then the media does the work for them and says, well, that's a very narrow majority. They're going to have to tack to the center. And Democrats read that and say, newspaper says it. We better do it. Yeah. They're telling our voters. Our voters read newspapers. We yeah. better pay attention. And I mean, it's hard to argue that we don't have a better grasp on those things. But our our voters can read. Yeah. Uh, that's the, that. Maybe that's the difference. Right. What does the TV say for the voters who can't? Right. And so for the voters who don't, uh, I don't know if they can't, but don't, for the voters right. who don't You're read right. and only watch Fox News, it's a completely different paradigm. So after the break, we'll talk about some other, you know, potpourri of things. Mm, OK. Always Katie one of the Porter, favorite. Diamond, oh, yes. Diamond and Silk. Right, right. Uh, Blake yes. Hounshell. Uh, yes, right. OK, uh, yeah. We'll Joe have a Biden's, roundup of uh, classified Six. documents, this, that and everything else. OK, we can wait for that. And by the way, uh, I have uh, conducted an investigation as to uh, why you hadn't shared that article. And it turns out that you did. It was in the list. You just uh, scrolled past it. But now we have it twice. Uh, that so list was covered. too long. Didn't read yeah, it. right. But uh, the point and is, it, it was there. And so therefore, I guess this means we have to subpoena somebody else. Now we have to talk about it twice. Uh, oh, maybe that's it. Okay. Sup fam, it's your boy Darwin, aka Darwin underscore Darko, aka the most reasonable man in America, aka KITM's senior black correspondent. You might remember me from such recordings as Spacemen vs. Space Cadets and we Need to Talk About Joe Biden. Today, I want to bring you good news about that thing you've been struggling with. Do you suffer from giving too much of a damn? Do you turn on the series of tubes and find yourself outraged at the particular way some news organizations strung some sentences together only to realize, nope, this is not some fictional hellscape? Well, guess what? You no longer have to accept a life of giving too much of a damn. You can do something about it because even you, yes you, can be a show contributor. Now I know what you're thinking. Hey, Mr. Most Reasonable Man in America, I'm not some professional podcast talking guy. Don't worry about it. Do you have a smartphone or some other electronic recording device? Well, that's all you need. You too can have a segment where you can read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Fair warning though, side effects may include general punditry, having opinions and hot takes, getting stuff off your chest, and hearing your own voice. If your recording lasts longer than five to seven minutes, please consult kagrox at gmail.com. That's K-A-G-R-O-X at gmail.com. All right, welcome back now to the Kager on the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. We continue. We have a lot to round up, and uh, up is the only way to go from here. So I see that... Uh... The uh, Merrick Garland uh, special prosecutor has uh, subpoenaed Rudy Giuliani. Yes, Jack Smith, if that is his real name. Uh, it's hard to believe it's a real name. It looks like a Hollywood uh, made-for-TV yeah. sort of thing. Sure. So uh, Jack Smith, if that's what your real name is, uh, is uh, you know slowly and methodically doing what they do. The slow is the operative term here because everybody's getting frustrated that Trump hasn't been indicted for anything yet. Yeah, although Smith is moving pretty quick. Smith is moving pretty quick. That's right. And so the other thing that's working fairly quickly is uh, Fannie Willis in Georgia. Oh. So there was an announcement that the Georgia grand jury had completed its purpose and has been dismissed. Georgia. Okay. And I saw a right. lot of 
that's Fulton County. And, and I saw a lot of uh, comments about, oh, my gosh, why didn't they indict him? I can't believe they didn't indict him. What's going on here? Uh, uh, as yeah. part of the general frustration that Trump never seems to be indicted. However, right. uh, this Lawfare article from October of 2022 was really useful in that regard. It's entitled Everything You Ever Wanted to Know About Georgia Special Purpose Grand Juries But Were Afraid to Ask. Huh. And if it's too Special long and you didn't purpose. read it, one has to be aware of the fact that this was, in fact, a special purpose grand jury. It uh, wasn't a what? A regular old grand jury, you know, I as in the Inigo Montoya they... saying, a grand jury, you keep using that word. I yeah. don't think it means what you think it means. A Georgia special purpose grand jury does mm. not indict. It's there to investigate. It then makes uh-huh. a recommendation to the district attorney. Who's the district that? attorney then decides whether or not to indict. And so uh, what happened here is they you finished their investigation. Them? They made the recommendations. We don't know what they are. <laughs> and on January 24th, secret. there will be a hearing to discuss whether or not the report from this special purpose grand jury shall be made public. Oh, what a process. All right. it, that's the process. So oh they're following God. the process. Uh, as a lawfare says, most readers will be familiar uh, with a regular old grand jury. As yeah. elsewhere, your run of the mill Georgia grand jury is composed of 16 to 23 lay people plucked from a pool of grudgingly eligible residents in the county jury roster. Selected jurors meet periodically throughout a fixed term of court, two months. Broadly speaking, the activities of the grand jury during that period can be divided into two functional categories and most readers would be familiar with the first which might be thought of as the criminal or accusatory function in georgia law like the fifth amendment it requires indictment by a grand jury in most felony cases as such the bulk of a regular grand jury's work involves screening the state's evidence to ensure it passes muster for probable cause if at least 12 jurors find probable cause to believe the accused committed a crime the grand jury returns a true bill that's the term I'm not a lawyer, so these are all fun terms for me. A true bill of indictment or a special presentment charging that Mm. individual with a criminal offense, all of which is pretty standard law and order type grand jury fare. So if you watch law and order on TV, which I don't, you'll understand what this grand jury does. Yeah, you can watch just about anything. But yeah, usually grand juries. Perry Mason, whatever. Literally. Yada, yada. Yeah. But Literally. less familiar to the general public is the second category, the grand jury's civil or investigative function. A regular grand jury carries out periodic civil investigations of certain government operations and facilities, and some of these investigations are mandatory. For example, the statute requires an annual inspection of the county jail. Oh. But regular grand juries also retain discretionary powers to inspect or investigate a wide range of county authorities, and at the end of its term... The grand jury can issue a public report called a general presentment explaining Mm. the results of its investigation. Federal grand juries used to issue reports. That's why the word presentment actually appears in the Fifth Amendment alongside indictment. Oh, yeah. For those of you who are like, uh, you know, into these things. But at the federal level, the practice of grand juries writing reports has almost entirely died. What Mm. then is so special about a special purpose grand jury? Well, for starters, special purpose grand juries are convened to investigate a specific topic. Second, special purpose grand juries are not limited to the typical two-month fixed term. And finally, Mm. unlike regular grand juries, Georgia's special purpose grand juries cannot return a true bill of indictment, but they do possess the power to issue comprehensive public reports, albeit after review by the supervising judge. Supervising judge already reviewed this and said, yep, it's okay. You guys can dissolve. I'm okay with this. We don't know what's in it, but they did the homework. (laughs) All right. I'm he not telling you what your grade is, but I want I you to know. know I reviewed your paper and you did everything you were supposed to, and I did grade it. I want you to know that. All right. Understandable. The, the report, and, and we'll debate on uh, January 24th whether or not I tell you what your grade is. <laughs> the report can re- recommend indictments for criminal acts uncovered during the investigation, and the DA can then pursue these indictments by impaneling a separate, regular, wait for it, grand jury. You're kidding. But uh, a special purpose grand jury is not limited to recommendations. No, special really. purpose grand juries have made a slew of recommendations related to government and ethics reforms. And what's more, the report's factual findings need not be limited to criminal wrongdoing. 
So their report can be wide ranging and just say basically, although technically he didn't commit a crime, the guy was a turd and he really should (laughs) be (laughs) held up by the public as being an awful person who did horrible things. Uh, We just can't get Capone on this one thing here. Well, I should hope we get something as fun as that anyway. Uh, Anyway, so they're allowed to do those things. Hmm. All right. This seems like unnecessarily long, this process. Uh, Oh, yeah. So then (laughs) I'm laughing at the article because at least the guys at Lawfare have a sense of humor. Their next subheading is, can you explain Georgia's special purpose grand jury procedure in excruciating and unnecessary detail? (laughs) Why, sure. Let's go. All right. Let's do it. (laughs) And then they went ahead and they did. And I'm thinking, you know, at least for my segments of the show, I could adopt this. Yeah. This could be my my subheading here. Really unbelievable. Look at this. So, uh, yeah, breaking it down into four phases and just the names alone. Entitlement, investigation, dissolution, publication. Yes. And they have extremely broad scope. DA Fannie Willis. Remember, Fannie Willis is the DA. So the idea that she's going to get a report that says you should indict Trump and she's going to say, nah, I don't know. I don't feel like it. Ah, ain't happening. I mean, it seems unlikely after going through this pain in the rear, whatever. I think you can say pain in the ass. That's fine. I mean, really, honestly. Okay, this is a very long process. So one grand jury to recommend that there be an indictment, at which point then you have to say, well, all right, where do we go to get this indictment drawn up? Oh, another regular general purpose grand jury. Oh, all right. But at least, you know, at least you know what you're presenting them. Usually grand jury evidence is secret. And this one will be at least largely based on a report that we may or may not. Well, that could be secret, too, depending on what happens on January 24th, I guess. Oh. And then and they go on to try to handle some of the many details. And they're trying to anticipate some of the defenses these juries that people would use against these special purpose grand juries. For example, yeah. the, they have another one that says, wait a second, the special purpose grand juries is civil not criminal. What difference does that make anyway? And their answer is no. Like, go back and read what we just wrote. Yeah. But the question repeatedly crops up in litigation related to the special purpose grand jury. Basically, uh, defendants like to argue that, well, since this is all civil, how dare you charge me with criminal? Uh, well, yeah. And the answer is, well, depends what lawyers broke. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, a civil body found that you broke a criminal law. Yeah, that's right. not and then they difficult. handed it over to the regular grand jury, which does criminal indictments and true bills and all that sort of ah. stuff. So I don't really all see right. the difference. So that's handled. But, you know, people do do this and it's a way of uh, arguing so that you just lengthen the time between when you get charged and when you go to jail. Yeah. So that's Trump. Well, he'll be doing that. Right. Uh, so is there any merit, uh, Lawfare says, to the idea that the special purpose of grand jury's investigation is civil? And the answer is, in short, no, let me explain. I won't, but I'm just telling you it's come up before. Hmm. Okay. Uh, Oh, no, precedent. See if that helps. Uh, Mark Meadows never showed up. Why hasn't he been held in contempt? This was in October because he's not legally required to testify as of the writing of this article. The jurors vote to adopt the report and recommendations. And if so, how many votes are needed? They do vote. It's unclear how many votes are needed. Oh, uh, boy. And the reason there's ambiguity, you have to understand the two types of presentments issued by regular grand juries <laughs> in Georgia. There's one called a special presentment and a general presentment. And the distinction set out is clear. The final report issue is going to be a general presentment. And so how many jurors are needed? Well, there's different, different rules and regulations, <laughs> so it's not clear. Wow. All right. So you never know what you're going to get. You might get nothing. It's still possible. Those of you who are eternal pessimists. Right. For those who prefer to skip the finer (laughs) points of this, here are a few observations from previous Atlanta area corruption probes. Generally, the factual narratives are meatier than the bare bones recitations. The reports often reveal individual sources of information and provide comprehensive summaries of witness testimony. The recommendations contained in the reports go well beyond recommendations for criminal indictments. For example, the Gwinnett report suggested ethics reforms. The DeKalb report included recommendations for indictments, but also recommended further criminal investigation of certain individuals. And in addition to several policy and ethics reforms, this special purpose grand jury recommended the immediate removal of uh, DeKalb's then CEO, Burrell Ellis. Hmm. So there's a number of things that they could do. So it's going to be very interesting, and that's why we all hope 
this thing will be made public. We understand secrecy. Damn, we really, man. again, it's a tactic, Oof. not a strategy. The The end goal is to get indictments where indictments are needed, but we want to see what they have to say. And in the process of seeing what they have to say, we also want to know what kind of evidence they were working with. I'd like to know. Uh, but as long as they get in there that he's a turd, that will be sufficient for me. Well, I, I just, you know, that's a legal term. But I, yeah. I just thought that it was a, uh, and, and if you're arguing it's not a legal term, okay, I'm not a lawyer. I will tell you, however, I am a doctor. It's a medical term. Right. Okay. <laughs> At least that much. Right. So the the thing is, uh, I just think it's a fascinating uh, use of the public uh, appropriateness and good of having rule of law. And so we're all really interested in the outcome of that one. Yeah. Boy. All right. Well, take your time, Georgia. Holy cow. Well, I took my time in explaining it. <clears throat> yeah. Well, there was no but, choice. That was sh shorter than they wrote it. Uh, <laughs> I only did a third of their article. Yeah. Oh, it's huge. Well, when they said, uh, oh, that, what excruciating they, detail. Oh, wow. Well, I understand. They I meant understand. It. I used to do the same thing all the time. It was a, Congress Matters was nothing but. <laughs> the, and in fact, so was this show. Well, I thought you'd appreciate it for both those reasons. Yes. Well, now we all know. Right. So uh, speaking of legal stuff, uh, this is a very short article by Sean Wu that oh, is right. in uh, Daily Beast. Joe Biden and Donald Trump's classified doc scandals are worlds apart. Oh, yes. All right. Uh, and just points out the not the fact that they both have the term classified in it, but the huge difference. Yes, there okay. are many. Uh, uh, the archives didn't realize these things were missing. Biden's lawyers found it. It's not clear how they got there. Uh, there's a few of them. It's not clear uh, how classified they are. I mean, some things get classified like schedules. That's true. They do turn out to be classified sometimes. Uh, well, that's what happened with Hillary's uh, uh, so-called classified uh, ah, emails. Is that right? Okay. So we know that that's the we fact. We know that. Uh, Special but, purpose classification. Uh, Biden's though. lawyers, packing up his former office, uh, found these, immediately turned them over to archives. Yes, that's the big difference, really. That's an, an incredibly big difference. Uh, yes. So archives didn't know they were missing. Biden's lawyers found it, immediately turned it over. There was no intent to conceal. Yeah. The well, there's no crime there. The crime, no crime is the that the, the, uh, Trump faces is give them back. No. Well, okay, that's well, a crime. Well, first, what, even before that, hey, these things are missing. Yeah, right. Do you have them? No. No. Well, we think you do. Give them back. No. Yeah, and then right. everything so the, follows. Well, these are the crimes that are involved as opposed to, uh, hey, I have these. Can we have them back? Yes. Oh, all, right. all right. So it's so. unlikely uh, that the uh, assigned uh, district attorney – or uh, attorney, uh, whatever they call them, the U.S. Know. attorney. U.S. attorney. Uh, oh, okay. well, yeah. uh, right. And, and it's a, a Trump appointed uh, U.S. attorney in Chicago, John Lausch. No. Oh. The facts as we know them make it highly unlikely Lausch will find evidence of criminal behavior, given the lack of any effort to conceal or obstruct, which would be critical in finding criminal intent. Even instant political spin put forth by Republicans like uh, Kevin McCarthy. Sure. Focus entirely on using the Biden documents as a defense of Trump, because mm -hmm. everything that the Republican Congress, uh, the House is going to do specifically is going to be Trump defense. You know, yes. they're I mean, either the going to try to wreck sense. the government or they're going to defend Trump. Those are the only two things that we're trying to do. It's often the same. Yeah. Right. So. Um, so uh, one question now will be whether Garland chooses to appoint a special counsel. And this article <laughs> makes the point saying, John well, you Durham. could do that. For the appearance of even handedness, but in fact, because if there's no crime, you don't have to. It'd be stupid to do that. Well, uh, Judge Deary is is free. He's no uh, longer yeah. a special master, so we'll point him. Right. But I don't think you get to uh, ask for it to be uh, covered in the Mar a Lago district. Mm, right, yeah. Well, it won't be happening there. Uh, so, but the U.S. attorney that's doing it is a guy from Chicago? Yeah. On what? So he's going to do it the Chicago way. I guess so. That's right. All right. Well, you send one of ours to the archives. <laughs> and we'll send three of yours. <laughs> okay. To the. I don't know what. Yeah, I, I guess know. so. Goodness. This is really not a, that intimidating, really. The archives, eh? Anyway, well, so I think it's uh, much do bet nothing. And, and uh, you know, the the uh, I, I've seen the point made, uh, and, and I think it's a good one. 
that uh, the worldview of conservatives is that they lose everything. Hmm. How do they we're looking at things like, you know, all right, so we have the Republican House pain in the butt. And now they're going to do these investigations pain in the butt. Uh, Biden obviously made an error. You're not supposed to have these documents pain in the butt. Yeah. We'll deal with them. But it isn't good news. It's sort of semi depressing to, you know, kind of see these things when right. you really like to, you know, hone in on other things. I, I hear Russia may actually win a battle, not the war, but they may win a battle in Ukraine. That's, you know, sort of depressed, you know. Right. So it, it's not all good news and, and uh, you know, unicorns and roses and all that sort of thing. Oh. Rainbows, whatever you like. Uh, for us. But for the hard right conservatives, everything's terrible. Oh, yes. Well, right. They're always America's losing. They're hellhole. always the victim. They're always, you know, on the defensive. And there's reason for that. Democrats okay. are trying to get policy passed and they're trying to get stuff done. And sometimes there's uh, roadblocks to it and stuff you have to work out. And so eventually you get there. And even though we lose, eventually we think we're going to win. Keep your eye on the prize, that sort of thing. But with uh, hardcore conservatives, their uh, Christian white national America is not going to come back. We are not returning to 1960s or even 1980s America. Hmm. And, and so when they look at it and feel like that. they're losing, they are. When they feel like policy has nothing to do with it or, you know, is as Breitbart used to put it, uh, uh, politics is just downstream from culture. They're losing the culture wars mm. uh, because they are. I mean, what they want is they basically want American Sharia and they're not getting it. Uh, so they feel like they're losing everything. And so nothing's going to cheer them up. And so that justifies in their mind anything and everything. It's a completely different worldview. And it's just good to remind ourselves of that, because no matter how annoying things like oh, why did biden wind up with uh confidential documents hmm. in an office that he's not in right now yes that he immediately turned over and that there's no criminal intent it's still annoying it's even a, a story because yep. you know right people are going to say well look at the equivalents there isn't any but you know the stories are going to come and so it why do we even have to deal though. with that and the answer is you do because that's life yeah but it's not a big well, deal just it's not it's... a big deal the way conservatives have a big deal in that the, their life style that they want, where mm. only uh, conservative Protestant white men have any decision making power. They want it back. They're not getting it. They can't even get it in South Carolina, let alone Alaska, Pennsylvania, Ohio. Mm. So I understand why they're depressed. They are losing. Yes, so. No, they're and losers. It's good that they lose, and that cheers me up when I look at all this other stuff that I wish went the other way. Yeah. Well, okay. I mean, fair enough. Uh, and and uh, you know, they do find. Oh, I by think the way, that Diamond the Diamond and Silk was dead. Oh well, that's uh, that w that's depressing. If you're if rest the, in peace. If the other one. Yeah, sure. There you go. I uh, am have not a good time. Uh, engaging in whether or not she died of COVID. I think it would be irresponsible not to speculate, but uh, we yes. don't know. All right, we don't know that the answer is yes. Uh, we don't know. <laughs> We're not sure about that. Right. Uh, nope. And somebody who did die, which I think is actually very sad, is a reporter named Blake Hounshell. He's a New York Times reporter, but he's uh. also known for uh, his work at both foreign policy hmm. and yeah, the Politico, the Politico sure. magazine. We've and as articles. you read uh, uh, the stories about him, he's relatively youngish, and all the yeah, stories well, uh, will say is that he... Uh, had a long-standing battle against depression, and they leave it at that. Well, all right. I think we know what that means. We leave it at that. Uh, but uh, everybody who knew him loved him, hmm. which is really unusual yeah. in a uh, reporting world where everybody's trying to scoop each other. That's true. Uh, uh, and they uh, all say, you know, he was one of those, he didn't like to write, he liked to edit. He was one of these behind-the-scenes hmm. people who just helped everybody. And uh, different stories about how we helped this one, how we helped that one, how uh, uh, somebody who was at the Washington Post with him as a young reporter went in and complained that as a woman, she was not getting paid the same as the people around her, wasn't getting promotions, and he wasn't her supervisor. He was just a sympathetic ear, and he did something about it, and it was really good, and that was like hmm. who he really was. 
Now, one of the things that came across uh, that was interesting about Blake Hounshell for our peeps is that they also described him as somebody who was one of the very online reporters. He was one of the first Mm -hmm. to grasp the Internet and social media and what it was and what it could do. I felt like I saw his name so often. Yeah. Uh, But first of all, he loved to tweet. And often he was like during the Arab Spring was one of the first tweeters who was live tweeting what was going on. Okay. Uh, So he made use of that. But interestingly, I also came across an obscure reference, which I followed up and found out that uh, he also was very familiar with blogs back in the day. Hmm. Golden Age of Blogs. Oh. And this is a piece from Wednesday, October 20th, 2004, from Daily Coast, uh-huh. written by a guy named Prak Tyke, P-R-A-K-T-I-K-E. It only had about 50 comments. It was about whether black voters were going to break toward Bush in 2004, not Kerry. Oh. Okay. And I just thought it was interesting because he wrote this very short piece uh, and then as I was looking through the comments, there was one comment by me. There was one comment by Armando. There was a <laughs> comment by a fellow named James B3, who used to blog with the two of us over <laughs> yes. at the next hurrah. Wow. If you remember these names. Yeah. So this is Blake Houncho. Practite was Blake Houncho. Oh. And he was online. And one of the reasons he was so familiar with the online community is because he participated in blogs and blogging community. Well, no wonder. All right. That is interesting. Like, uh, for those who might have forgotten that, uh, uh, Nate uh, Silver was Nate Silver was Pablano. Yeah, that's right. Over so Daily Coast, interesting. Okay, and Daily Coast used to be a place where you know it's like Twitter today. You used to be able to talk with Charlie Cook and Nate Silver, and you know you didn't. Right. Mess- Charlie Cook always used his real name. Nate Silver didn't. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't. You know. I didn't. Right. You know, but you, so you didn't always know exactly who you were talking to. But obviously, these people were knowledgeable. That's... Which you found out if you ever argued with KGRX about the uh, procedure. Yeah. Uh, you don't know anything about procedure. <laughs> what, well, what hold you... on. Well, actually, I know a lot. Right. Whereas you could, you were always there to to say you were available for for your lines like that's uh, bullshit. Things like that, <laughs> <laughs> and about vaccines and whatnot. Right. right that that you know, and, and again uh, for the you old timers, uh, you know, <laughs> one of my fun uh, uh, memories is uh, having uh, uh, Dana Hole. Mm. who knows an awful lot about politics and went on to be a chief of staff, arguing with uh, David Waldman as KGX about policy. Yes. And then arguing about procedure. Mm. And uh, yeah, they know often had some very good points about politics, and uh, uh, David was generally right about procedure. Uh, well, we had all the bases covered there. Yeah, we did. So it was a wonderful discussion, uh, which everybody else would chime in with what you just said. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they didn't know, and you guys yeah. did, and that's why... You know, I loved watching it. So uh, that still happens. We still have some very skilled and knowledgeable people there, politicos and others who were there. Uh, Nowadays, we tend to know who they are because they tend to use their real name, but not all of them do. Mm -hmm. Uh, And we have a lot of people, for example, uh, up in New England, we have town meetings and we have uh, 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 local town uh, committees. And we have a lot of committee members uh, there who are in the comments. I see them in the pundit roundup in the mornings. And talk about uh, what their towns are up to. So, you know, again, the online uh, community can be a real useful source of information from actual experts. Yeah. And so, you know, it's always nice uh, to see somebody like Blake Hounshell get a start there. How did we come to know that that was his online name? His it handle? was mentioned in one of the stories hmm. uh, doing tributes to him ah, okay. that, that he was online uh, using the name Practike. Hmm. And so I looked up Practike and there it was. Wow. It's for it real. Does. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to have to have a look at myself. But uh, interesting. Well, I don't know. We did a good thing there for a while. It was, yeah, it still was continues. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was a unique time. And uh, I'm glad he enjoyed it uh, while he was with us. Yeah. Anyway. Hmm. So that's go. Okay. That, that was good. Yes. I mean, that's a good way. That's a nice way of uh, wrapping up a, a story that could otherwise uh, be real. You know, the, the, I don't mean to bring depression back no, into it's, it's it, but sad. I mean, it's sad. Uh, it's, you know, make people but, upset. Uh, actually, there's a, there is a human a good touch memory. there, and, and it actually uh, touched us. Yeah, and a good memory to take away from it. Um, okay, very good. Not like uh, I don't have anything else to, to add to Diamond's story 
for instance. Yeah, no, she wasn't on Daily Coast, and we didn't interact in the same way. Yeah, so we don't know anything about it. So we don't know anything about it, so we'll just leave it there. Nothing good to say, sorry. And then the last thing I'll mention uh, is uh, I see that Katie Porter is officially launching her bid for Mm. the United States Senate. Right. She's going to take the whole thing. Are you? I am. Okay. First of all. Why? I don't understand why any staffer would let her make an announcement in the middle of California disasters. Uh, okay. Yeah, sure. That's number one. She's going to fix uh, it. And, you guess. know, number two, uh, it should be pointed out that she's running for Diane Feinstein's seat. Yes. And Feinstein hasn't announced her retirement. Uh, yes, they're hoping to make that happen, I guess. Well, uh, you know, it. Uh, in terms of how it looks, neither of those things make her look particularly astute. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, I mean, usually you wait for things like that. Are there other announced candidates? There. No, but everybody knows Adam Schiff is running. Mm. Oh. Okay. And there's already polls out, including from uh, Katie Porter's own internal poll, showing Schiff in the lead and her closing in. Oh. Uh-huh. But there's a lot of talent out there. There's a lot of people who could run. California, I just, right. I, I, I'm of just course. not – I'm not saying she wouldn't be a good senator. She'd be a great senator. And whoever wins the Democratic nomination is probably going to be the next senator. And yes. I'd be fine with her. Okay. But, you, uh, you know, saying this. I would really prefer something a little bit more normy. Hmm. Okay. Wait for the person to hmm. uh, resign or, or commit to not running and uh, don't announce in the middle of a uh, – a, a, a true uh, uh, environmental disaster. Yeah, well, that's uh, <clears throat> that's true. I guess uh, I'm sure the pressure she Wait was up days. against was well, if you don't announce now, you know, or if you announce now, you could preclude someone else from getting in. I don't know. Well, maybe, not maybe happen. not. Um, I mean, there's no rationale that not can make you look good, and a whole bunch of stuff that can make you look bad. I'm just I saying. guess so. I'm not certain why the decision was was made for then. Uh, you might find, yeah, unfortunately, like you might find She'd that make a uh, great, uh, you know. And yeah, by the way, whoever board, replaces so, you know, her, fantastic, uh, could yeah. well be a Republican. That's true too. That's a little dangerous. Uh, so that's so, something to you worry know, you about. You add up all those things, and mm. I'm saying, I, mm. rather than, oh, this is wonderful. It just makes my day. It doesn't make my day. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, I know she has a lot of enthusiastic supporters, and that's good. And and we're, we're enthusiastic supporters of her work in the house, certainly. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, there is that. Uh, Just wrong um, time, wrong place, wow. and especially that time. Uh, yeah, maybe. Although I'm beginning to suspect, and I think she probably was driven by this, that you might not get what's coming to you if you wait patiently on Diane Feinstein. And she, and yet that might really be the right answer for her to bow out. But I'm not certain she's in that place mentally where she'll realize it. And bow she's out. getting advice from Strom Thurmond's people. Yeah, right. So, you know, I can see the impatience. All right. We'll take this uh, or other topics up again tomorrow. Thanks, Greg. All right. Welcome back now to the K-Grow in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Yeah, well, uh, that's uh, some interesting points. Mm, there's uh, very often uh, no ideal time to announce that you're running for Senate when there's already an incumbent from your party in that seat. But, uh, yeah, very frequently the practice is to uh, talk behind the scenes and come to some sort of an agreement when it's clear that uh, the time for retirement has come. But they've been having – I think they've been trying to have that conversation for a long time and either don't seem to be getting through or when they do get through, conditions change, i.e., you know, it's forgotten that they had come to some agreement. It's it's going to be very difficult. And at some point, you know, you, you can't wait any longer, but – I don't know that that's the point. I don't know that this is the point that we're at. Uh, Adam Schiff, had he announced, I guess he's all but announced, but when he announces, I, I imagine that he's waiting for that time where it's clearer that uh, time is running out and we either have to jump in and uh, ignore the fact that Feinstein can't or won't come to this conclusion Um but yeah, I don't know what I don't I don't I don't know where I would put that point in time. But uh, I'm sure they've brainstormed it. But on the other hand, I guess I would say you know although the timing is not great with the environmental disasters going on at the same time, I imagine that they had this discussion strategically among the Porter team, and they may have said, well, 
the issue we have is that Schiff is going to get in. Schiff will be doing all the calculus about what's the right time and what's the last date on which we can announce. How long can we wait on Feinstein to make her own decision? And at what point do we have to move, regardless of whether she's made the decision or not? All done by the traditional calculus. Now, if you are trying to get in the race as well, and I don't know why you are, but you are, you think you're going to be good at the job. I assume that's it, right? So if you're making that calculus, I guess you have to say to yourself, so uh, there are three points in time, generally speaking, at which I could make my own announcement. I could make that announcement at the exact same moment somehow uh, as Adam Schiff, in which case uh, we look like uh, we're already at each at odds with one another. Uh, and, you know, one of us isn't going to win the primary. If, possibly both of us won't win the primary, but only one of us can win the primary. So uh, announcing right on top of one another, well, that just looks like, you know, you're not an independent actor. You're just waiting to stomp on Schiff's announcement, which might not be a bad tactic, really. I don't know. We'll see how that works out. But as between the two of them, uh, if there's a question of which one can attract more Press attention, I don't know, I guess. Uh, well, Porter's got her special way about her and attracting attention, um, and it's a good one. Uh, but I guess Schiff is maybe more of the national figure and might command more uh, traditional media interest. So that leaves either announcing before Adam Schiff does or after Adam Schiff does. And I think most people would probably say, well, you know, if you announce after Adam Schiff does, then uh, a couple of things arise. One, you look like, oh, you didn't really think about running for the Senate until Adam Schiff decided he was going to, and then you decided to get in on it too. And what does that mean? Are you saying Schiff's not good enough for the job and you have to come in riding to the rescue? That raises those questions. Uh, it seems to me like your only choice is to announce before. I thought of this first, or I, you know, I'm I'm doing my own thing. I'm not waiting to see what other people do, uh, you know. But if, if there are only those three choices, uh, and you really to announce at exactly the same time would require some incredible coordination and precision, or making the decision early and then chickening and chickening out of it and saying I'm going to wait and I'm going to announce on the same day for strategic purposes. There's only three ways to do it, before, after, or at the exact same time, like the coin lands on its side, heads or tails, plus lining on side. So, you know, she's got to make her decision at some point. So we'll follow that, how that goes. She's got a lot of fans, very enthusiastic fans uh, in the online communities because uh, she's, you know, she's made a real impression with her uh, straightforward style, the whiteboard presentation, the things that she's done in committees. She's been very effective with that. And of course, Adam Schiff, uh, his work in very important and pivotal committees and uh, uh, making a real case for the impeachment of Donald Trump twice on national television. And uh, well, uh, an embarrassment of riches, as they say. It's always a deep bench in California because California has a hundred bazillion people in it and only two senators. And sometimes those senators tend to serve for six to seven hundred years at a time. And entire generations of potential leadership uh, are born, grow to maturity and die before a Senate seat becomes available. And it's uh, kind of difficult to contemplate and uh, annoying when you also realize, of course, that Wyoming has two Senate seats, but that's another discussion. All right. So now let's see a few other things to share with you. And there are many. One, a short one. I will borrow from the Mastodon toot <laughs> from, uh, well, a, a retweet of a Josh Marshall tweet, but a retweet of the tweet. It was published at Twitter, Josh Marshall speaking there, and Maltese Mama, I guess someone who's got a Maltese, uh, passing this on, bringing it, carrying it over to the Mastodon universe. But a good point being made by Josh, uh, noting 
with respect to this establishment of the uh, investigative subcommittee on the weaponization of the federal government that Greg mentioned to you. It is worth noting, Josh says, that the centerpiece committee that the House GOP has created amounts to an investigation into what the so-called deep state has done to Trump and his friends. That's right. Their big reorganization of the House, their big uh, 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 commitment of resources is to say, yeah, we want to investigate the deep state and why they don't like me and my friends. And that's basically it. And it's kind of pathetic. But I thought it was, a you know, well put the statement there. All right. Uh, other things to share with you. Let's see. Oh, these some of these things have to get out of the way um, that uh, we covered yesterday. All right. Um, I think I will throw it back a little bit to cover some news that I didn't include the day I got it when my brother Mark sent me uh, this article. And now it's a couple of days old. And it's actually a summary, a Salon magazine a uh, summary of what had been reported previously by the New York Times, but I thought that they uh, and the analysis that they provided was was helpful on top of the news itself, which I think we may have missed. So it begins this way: the headline is "Breakdown in Trust," and that in quotes, "Breakdown in Trust." Now, colon expert says judge's order suggests DOJ suspects Trump has. More classified documents. Now, this is from a couple of days ago and, in fact, was written and published before breaking the story about Biden having been discovered to have been or his office anyway, having uh, housed and whether he was in possession of these things or not. I don't know. But classified documents of his own. So in addition to drawing the line between the two cases, you should also be aware that it is. Uh, the opinion of the analysts here that the judge has issued an order that the judge would only issue if there was suspicion on the part of the prosecution and the judge agreement on the part of the judge that Trump has even more classified documents and still there are that they're still yet to be found in his possession more than the hundreds that they've seized already. Uh, this comes from January 6th, and uh, Igor Derish is the writer for Salon. A federal judge on Wednesday, that'd be a week ago, ordered former President Donald Trump's lawyers to turn over the names of the private investigators who were hired to search Trump's properties last month for additional classified documents. This according to the New York Times reporting on the subject. Chief Judge Beryl Howell of the Federal District Court in Washington issued an order siding with the Justice Department, which is looking into the question the investigators, uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry, which is looking to question the investigators about the search. You'll recall, uh, after being through 10 rounds of, do you have documents? No. Yes, you do. We found them. Uh, let us come and take a look around. No. Uh, all right, well, then we'll uh, force our way in with a search warrant. And they did, and it wasn't really much of a force. But anyway, you know, after finding uh, documents, hundreds of them, and seizing them, et cetera, then they said, well, we want to know about whether you might actually have some more documents either here or in a storage unit or at other properties. And the options were either let the FBI come in and search or you could uh, conduct your own search, hire private investigators to conduct the search. How are you going to do it? And the Trump uh, crew there opted to hire their own investigators to conduct the search. They came back and uh, they said, well, here's what we found. And uh, we attest that there are no more. Of course, this would be the second, third, fourth, I don't know, time that the Trump team has attested that they had no more such documents, only to be found out that they, in fact, did have more such documents. And that's the problem. That's where the breakdown in trust comes in. The November search, which turned up at least two additional documents marked classified at a storage unit 
near Mar-a-Lago was conducted months after the FBI seized about 100 documents marked classified from the president's residence in August. A top DOJ official told Trump's lawyers in October that the department believed the former president still had classified materials. Trump's attorneys had previously affirmed that the former president had returned all classified documents last summer before investigators found the additional materials. The DOJ's request to identify the private investigators who conducted the November search, quote here, suggests an increasing breakdown in trust, unquote, between prosecutors and Trump's lawyers, they really probably don't trust each other at all, whom they have accused of not being forthcoming about the documents, according to the Times's Alan Fuhr. Prosecutors under new special counsel Jack Smith, if that is his real name, in sealed court filings last month asked Howell to hold Trump's lawyers in contempt for failing to comply with the original subpoena issued in May for all the classified documents. Sure, why not, right? Howell, though, has still not made a decision on the contempt request, according to the Times. The latest request from the DOJ came after prosecutors asked Trump's lawyers to turn over the names of the investigators who searched the storage unit and other Trump properties, including Mar-a-Lago, his Bedminster, New Jersey golf resort, and Trump Tower. Well, right. Why not? We want to ask them questions. So how did you conduct your search? Was there any point at which you decided that something that uh, you might maybe that something someone else might think was important or relevant, but you made a judgment call that it wasn't and you withheld it? What are those things? Can we see them? Can you tell us why you thought they weren't relevant, et cetera? But we have to start with what are your names so that we can question you, subpoena you later? Trump's lawyers offered to make the investigators available for questioning, but wanted to keep their identities hidden by a protective order over concerns of potential leaks, according to the report. Oh, it's a thought. Okay, I don't know whether it's legit or not. Prosecutors did not agree to the protective order and asked Howell to compel the release of the names. Prosecutors have already questioned several Trump associates in the case, including Walt Nauta. Nauta? Is that right? N-A-U-T-A. He's a former White House military valet who went to work for Trump at Mar-a-Lago. Stole him off of the White House staff, I guess. Well, you can have him. But prosecutors have indicated they are skeptical of his initial account about moving documents stored at Mar-a-Lago and have been using the specter of charges against him to persuade him to cooperate with the inquiry, according to the Times. Prosecutors also conferred immunity, oh boy, on former Trump aide Kash Patel, rats, who, uh, in order to force him to testify to the grand jury after he initially invoked his Fifth Amendment rights and refused to answer questions. Oh well. I don't know if that was the way to do it, but I guess that was their only option. The new request suggests that Smith's team may still believe that there are more documents still out there. If the special counsel were convinced that it had all the classified documents once squirreled away by Trump, it wouldn't care who the investigators are. That's a theory. That was tweeted by MSNBC legal analyst Lisa Rubin. But her by pressing for the names, investigators are revealing how much they want to talk to the PIs about what's still out there although there was that offer of making them available but suppressing their names in reports. Hmm. Legal experts have suggested that Trump's lawyers could face prosecution themselves after they falsely affirmed last year that the former president had returned all the documents before investigators turned up even more. Trump also faces a DOJ investigation into his role in the January 6th Capitol riot, as you know, which is also being overseen by Smith, and a Georgia investigation, not not with indictments attached to it, not yet, a Georgia investigation into his efforts to overturn the 2020 election. He is also facing $250 million civil lawsuit from New York Attorney General Letitia James, the judge overseeing the case said in court filings that he is considering imposing sanctions for frivolous litigation over Trump's attempt 
to dodge the lawsuit with an end run around to a Florida judge using the same legal arguments that this court previously rejected. Hmm. Okay. Well, lots of trouble for him still in the offing, but, uh, just one, I thought that was actually good timing that we had forgotten to read this article, but, uh, this highlights some of the most serious differences between the, uh, well, uh and, uh, demonstrates the falsity of the equivalency argument as between Biden having classified documents and Trump having them. It's compliance makes all the difference. The crime was the defiance. So don't defy and you won't have a crime on your hands in most cases. All right. Well, let's see. Uh, that does sound an awful lot like just comply, though, doesn't it? We don't love that explanation for anything. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, there were a few other items that I wanted to share with you that uh, um, I think demonstrate some of the fine points of some of the other developing stories out there from the Brazil story, still a developing subject as well. Um, did we, and I don't think we read this one, but uh, if we find ourselves with Philip Bump in front of us again, did we not read this one? Uh, oh, yes, perhaps we did. Did we get all the way through this one or did we stop? Why did I retain this piece? Now, I think we did get all the way through this one. Uh, okay, <laughs> never mind that one. That one should have been filed away. Uh, but there was uh, a few other items that uh around the brazil story that uh i i think are of some interest and uh, we saved this one also from the washington post this one from elizabeth dwaskin who has spelled dworkin incorrectly if you ask me but this is an interesting uh side note i guess about all of this and one that i've seen getting some fairly wide play out there the headline of the piece is Come to the War Cry Party. How social media helped drive mayhem in Brazil. And we've seen a lot of talk about uh, how Elon Musk has been, of course, handling Twitter uh, in general. But apparently, uh, just like he's done in most areas, apparently the uh, employees Twitter maintained in Brazil were mostly fired as part of his general purge and of course that it would have included all the people who previously had been responsible for monitoring Brazilian Twitter for content that would uh, run afoul of its rules encouraging violence uh, spreading disinformation etc cetera, etc cetera. two main you know the two main inputs into a situation like they found themselves in as we found ourselves in on January 6th with rioters storming their capital. Well, here, a uh, slightly different tack here, I think described in the subheader, researchers detected a surge in aggressive rhetoric from election denialists in far-right channels online ahead of Sunday's rioting, not specifically focusing on, on uh, Twitter per se, but uh, the general online atmosphere. Um, the focus instead in the weeks leading up to Sunday's violent attacks on Brazil's Congress and other government buildings, the country's social media channels surged with calls to attack gas stations, refineries, and other infrastructure. Wow. As well as for people to come to a war cry party in the capital, according to Brazilian social media researchers, online influencers who deny the results of the country's recent presidential election used a particular phrase to summon quote patriots to what they called a festa de selma tweaking the word selva a military term for war cry by substituting an m for the v in hopes of avoiding detection from brazilian authorities who have wide latitude to arrest people for anti-democratic postings online festa is the portuguese word for party so, hmm, okay. I guess this would be like uh, tweeting uh, hang Trump, T-R-U-N-P. And then people would say, oh, he obviously meant, well, no, I was, um, if you're looking to avoid uh, automated detection, that might work for you. 
Uh, or instead, you, you uh, do what I do and say, use the picture of the race car and say Trump Mustang and just leave it at that. Anyway, organizers on Telegram posted dates, times, and routes for, quote, liberty caravans that would pick people up in at least six Brazilian states and ferry them to the party, according to posts viewed by the Washington Post. One post said, Attention patriots, we are organizing for a thousand buses. We need two million people in Brasilia. That online activism culminated in busloads of people landing in the capital Sunday, where they stormed and vandalized three major government buildings, reportedly setting fires and stealing weapons in the most significant assault on the country's democratic institutions since a military coup in 1964. On Monday, Meta, the parent company of Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp, declared the rioting a violating event. <laughs> They're uh, more the most powerful uh, multinational uh, or international organizations, non-governmental organizations in the world now, these social media companies. They're going to declare it a violating event and said it would remove content that supports or praises these actions. In a statement, the company said, in advance of the election, we designated Brazil as a temporary high-risk location and have been removing content calling for people to take up arms or forcibly invade Congress, the Presidential Palace, and other federal buildings. We're actively following the situation and will continue removing content that violates our policies. Brazilian analysts have long warned of the risk in Brazil of an incident akin to the January 6th insurrection at the U.S. Capitol. In the months and weeks leading up to the country's presidential election in October, in which leftist Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva defeated the right-wing incumbent Jair Bolsonaro. Social media channels were flooded with disinformation, along with calls in Portuguese to, quote, stop the steal and cries for a military coup should Bolsonaro lose the election. On TikTok, researchers found that five out of eight of the top search results for the keyword ballots were actually for terms such as rigged ballots and ballots being manipulated. At the same time, Facebook and Instagram directed thousands of users who plugged in basic search terms about the election toward groups questioning the integrity of the vote. So that really is kind of dumb. Where were you on that? On Telegram, an organizing hub for Brazil's far right, a viral video taken down by authorities called for the murder of the children of leftist Lula supporters. That's that's getting pretty low there, folks. In the days following the final election tally on October 30th, Bolsonaro supporters who rejected the results blocked major highways across the country. These blockades morphed into demonstrations in dozens of cities, where supporters camped out in front of military bases for weeks. We didn't hear much about that. Some held signs saying, Stolen election, in English, a testament to the close ties between the right-wing movements in both countries. Though Lula's inauguration last week took place largely without incident, calls for violence and destruction have accelerated online in recent weeks, said researcher Michelle Prado, an independent analyst who studies digital movements in the Brazilian far right. For years now, our country has been going through a very strong process of radicalizing people to extremist views, principally online, she said. But in the last two weeks, I've seen ever-growing calls from people incentivizing extremism and calling for direct action to dismantle public infrastructure. Basically, people are saying we need to stop the country in its tracks and generate chaos. Posts demanding a coup, along with common pro-Bolsonaro hashtags claiming election fraud and stolen election have circulated on all social media services. The most violent rhetoric, as well as the most direct organizing, has taken place on the largely unmoderated messaging service Telegram. Researchers in Brazil and Twitter in particular was, uh, researchers in Brazil said Twitter in particular, was a place to watch because it is heavily used by a circle of right-wing influencers Bolsonaro allies who continue to promote election fraud narratives. Several influencers have had their accounts banned in Brazil and now reside in the United States. Bolsonaro himself was on vacation in Florida on Sunday. 
Billionaire Elon Musk, who completed his acquisition of Twitter in late October, fired the company's entire staff in Brazil, except for a few salespeople, said a person familiar with the firings who spoke on condition of anonymity. Who are these people, you might wonder? Uh, among those fired in early November included eight people, that's it, based in Sao Paulo, who moderated content on the platform to catch posts that broke its rules against incitement to violence and misinformation, the person said. The person said they were not aware of any teams actively moderating rule-breaking content on Twitter in Brazil, not currently anyway, criticism specifically targeting Alexandra de Moraes, I guess. Uh, My best guess at the pronunciation there. A judge at the Superior Electoral Court and the Supreme Federal Court, who is despised by Bolsonaro supporters because he has blocked many prominent right-wing leaders from posting online, has also stepped up since the election, Prado and others said. Footage circulating on social media from Sunday's demonstration showed rioters pulling a chair from a government building upon which they placed the seal of the Brazilian Republic. One rioter shouted, Look, everyone, it's Big Alexander's chair, using a derogatory nickname for Morais. Morais. That's my second attempt. Expletives followed, according to the video. It could not be confirmed whether the chair had been taken from his chambers. Uh, Doesn't really matter very much whether it did or didn't. We'll continue with this article and uh, uh, a roundup of other items that have been neglected, I think, in our next segment after this. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, the same guy who was just talking to you a second ago. Our Patreon subscription drive is still going strong with over 175 monthly donors who help keep us on the air. If we've helped keep you going during the pandemic, why not return the favor and help us keep going so we can all be together for the next disaster? Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, makes it easy to make secure, recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. Maybe you'd like to thank us for keeping you sane during the Trump era. Maybe you're looking forward to in-depth explanations of what's going on in the Biden administration. Whatever it is that keeps you listening, we need your help to keep bringing it to you. And hey, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running with those options too. Thanks again, everyone, for all your support. We literally could not do this without you. All right, welcome back now to the K Go in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. We have uh, the conclusion of this uh, social media analysis of what's happening in Brazil, or at least the social media component of it, to get through. Uh, we left off, of course, with uh, at the scene of the riot in Brasilia, where they uh, very menacingly produced a chair that may or may not have been from a particular judge's chambers, but okay. Despite their seeming similarities, Brazilian researchers said, Bolsonaro supporters are careful not to draw too many comparisons to January 6th in the United States because doing so could trigger arrest for inciting anti-democratic acts, a crime in Brazil. But I think at this point, uh, they're pretty much on the hook for the crime uh, regardless. But okay, they were being careful not to make outright comparisons for some reason. If January 6th is referenced, it was in a handful of posts this week. The utterances appear in code, said Victor Chagas. uh, Chagas, I don't know how you pronounce it. uh, C-H-A-G-A-S. A A professor at, oh boy, ready? uh, Fluminense Federal University in Rio de Janeiro State, who researches online far-right movements. I'm sorry if I got the university name wrong. Still, Chagas says... Sunday's riot was a clear attempt to emulate the invasion of the U.S. Capitol. I mean, it's as plain as it could be, I think, right down to the mode of dress, as a reproduction of Trumpist movements and a symbolic signal of strength and transnational connections from the global far right. And remember, they're out to own the globalists. So, gosh, it's a little weird. Chagas noted in Jan- that January 9th is an important nationalist symbol in Brazil, marking the day uh, the country's first ruler, Emperor Dom Pedro I, 
declared that he would not return to Portugal in what was popularly known as I Will Stay Day. Oh, okay. Well, that probably resonates a little differently with uh, Brazilians who actually know what this is about. Anyway, it is as if Bolsonarists were equating Bolsonaro with Dom Pedro and indicating that the former government will remain he said. Some posts have also referenced I Will Stay Day, indicating that the demonstrations would probably continue through Monday, he added. That would have been uh, just two days ago. In a tweet on Sunday, Bolsonaro, a prolific social media user who has been relatively quiet since his election defeat, denounced the attacks. Peaceful demonstrations by law are part of democracy, he tweeted, hours after the assault began. However, depredations and invasions of public buildings has occurred today, as well as those practiced by the left in 2013 and 2017, grr, were outside the law. Brazilian researchers said that among Bolsonaro supporters, a counter-narrative had begun to circulate on Sunday, blaming the Lula government and people from Lula's party for infiltrating peaceful democratic demonstrations to turn the country against supporters of Bolsonaro. Mm -hmm. The counter-narrative also had echoes of the January 6th insurrection in which many Trump supporters blamed left-wing activists for the violence. The mayhem Sunday was a disaster, said Paulo... Oh, boy. Uh, Figuere Figueredo, Figueredo, maybe. Paulo Figueredo Filho, a presenter for the right-wing channel, Josem Pan, who lives in Florida and had his social media accounts canceled by Moraes. It is Moraes' is, oh, boy, wet dream. Terrific. What a, what a uh, cultured reference he makes there. Okay. Well, at any rate, um, interesting angle on which to try to catch up on what had been happening in Brazil and bring in the social media aspect of it, too, uh, without necessarily focusing at all on Twitter, but certainly somewhat suspect, if even if it is just bad timing that uh, uh, Twitter unilaterally disarms against misinformation and the incitement to violence, just, you know, months, well, I guess weeks, really, before they decided to take advantage of that situation and uh, attack the Capitol. All right, let's see. A couple of other things that uh, should probably be added to the uh, collection, of the, the, the knowledge base here. Uh, I wanted to go back to, is this still uh, available a gifted article from the from Bloomberg that uh, now I can't recall exactly how this uh, got sent along, but uh, the uh, view into the what was had been revealed by the tax returns, Trump tax returns that had finally been made public uh, thanks to the four year saga of uh, of of House Democrats seeking to use the power they should have had on, you know, facially uh, to to get these returns, but instead things delayed in court for years. Well, Timothy O'Brien writing a piece in Bloomberg, Trump's tax returns are only part of the picture. Oh, really? Well, let's see what the rest of the picture is. The former president's filings outlined questionable business deductions, but how much are we still missing? That is a good question. Uh, which I think grows out of the other question that I had about his tax returns, where, uh, for instance, as I was contemplating, we found in the days, you know, immediately following their release that, for instance, Trump maintained foreign bank accounts in various uh, foreign countries, China included, in which, uh, which caused people to wonder, well, one, uh, what is he doing with these things? And there's really no reason to maintain a bank account in China, unless you're getting paid by Chinese entities, which probably shouldn't have been happening while you were president. Uh, so there's a lot of questions there. My question, though, was, what is he doing admitting to these things? I mean, if you're going to be a, a giant liar uh, and obstruct justice, I'm just surprised that he didn't just not tell his tax people, yeah, don't declare that we have a bank account in China. Don't tell people that. What do we need to tell the uh, tax authorities that for? Just lie and say we don't and keep the money. 
I'm just not certain why he didn't do that. And I guess this is uh, maybe an outgrowth of that question, Timothy O'Brien asking, well, uh, given uh, we, 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 allow, we found out a lot about a lot, but how much are we still missing? Now, weren't there some things that Trump would just say, just don't even talk about that? I don't know. And I don't know how you, you can't prove it from the returns, obviously, but from elsewhere, perhaps. Anyway, Democrats released six years worth of former President Donald Trump's tax returns last Friday. This article is written on January 3rd, so even further back, confirming earlier findings outlined in a pair of congressional an analyses of the records. Trump took hundreds of millions of dollars in questionable business deductions to lower his tax bills, paid a token amount of income tax in two years, and paid nothing at all during the final year of his presidency. The tax returns also reconfirmed previously reported truths about Trump's businesses and personal finances. Even though he's almost 77, he remains a haphazard operator, reliant on the financial cushion of his late father's wealth. He appears to donate little to charity and may not have made good on his promise to give away his presidential earnings. And his filings are pockmarked with tragic comic Trumpian flourishes. In some years, he gave the unlikely name of unreimbursed expenses to several of his business partnerships. Hmm. Trump was the first U.S. president since Gerald Ford to refuse to voluntarily release his tax returns, and the disclosure was long overdue. But some Republicans have indicated that Democrats had only partisan interests in mind when making them public. Beware, they warn, of an era of rampant financial transparency is now afoot, and the GOP, which takes control of the House of Representatives today, that was uh, on the third, can now disclose the tax returns of Democrats, members of President Joe Biden's family, and Supreme Court justices. Well, let's hope that's a promise from Republicans and not just a threat. Greater financial disclosure from legislators of every stripe, their closest family members in certain cases, and the Supreme Court itself would be a welcome development and a boon to good government. The GOP can't dump on Democrats by calling for the release of Biden's tax returns because, lo and behold, he has already done so. Biden has already or has also been subjected to the mandatory Internal Revenue Service audit required, required, of all presidents, Trump's predecessor, Barack Obama, was put through the tax review, too. Trump, magically, was not. Despite the fact that he was always complaining that he was, in fact, being audited, he was not. The House Ways and Means Committee's report on Trump's tax returns notes how forcefully officials in his administration tried stymieing efforts to release the returns. Perhaps that's why Trump wasn't properly audited. Maybe it was just bureaucratic ineptitude. Either way, a robust examination of the lapse is in order. More disclosure from, Trump's, uh, from Trump himself is in order, too, especially since he plans to run for president again in 2024. It's handy to have returns for the 2015 to 2020 tax years, but there are ample and important financial disclosures still missing from those documents. It's also vital that Trump returns stretching or that Trump's returns tax returns that is stretching back to the years long before he became president be released as well. Good luck with that. Taxpayers and voters still don't have a complete understanding of the possible financial conflicts of interest that surrounded Trump before, during and after his presidency. To what extent was public policy making corrupted by these conflicts? How much of a national security threat is posed by Trump's global business dealings and other matters buried in his wildly complex and opaque finances? We now know how much money Trump reported earning for a handful of years out of decades he spent working as a developer, entertainer, casino operator, and snake oil salesman. We still know far too little about exactly who he did business with and to whom he is indebted. The tax records released last week indicate that Trump had foreign bank accounts in China, Britain, Ireland, and St. Martin. The amount of money held in those accounts wasn't detailed. Trump had the bank account in China in 2015, 16, and 17, even though he claimed during a presidential debate 
that he shut it before embarking on his 2016 presidential bid. So that was a lie. He had more than $40 million in gross income from overseas operations in 2016 and pulled in more than $55 million in foreign income the following year, according to his tax records. The returns listed reportable dealings in more than 20 overseas countries or territories, including China, the UK, Ireland, Azerbaijan, Panama, okay, India, Qatar, South Korea, the United Arab Emirates, the Philippines, Israel, Brazil, Mexico, Indonesia, and Turkey. Gee whiz. Foreign funds have flowed into earlier Trump projects as well. The partnership that he built, that built the Trump Soho Hotel and condominium development with the former president received funding from Eastern Europe and included a career criminal in its ranks. Trump spent years trying to craft deals and financial ties in Russia, which offers one of the more plausible explanations for why he cultivated Russian President Vladimir Putin so closely. All of this remains very messy and very murky. For as long as Trump casts a shadow across the global political stage, it's also a significant problem. So be grateful that a glimpse of Trump's finances has entered the public realm, but don't settle for that. A much fuller picture awaits. So it's all just, you know, rampant speculation, but pretty well based. And uh, given that uh, he's hidden so much in the past, I, you know, although still it makes you wonder, and I wonder whether there was any strategy to it. Well, let's disclose these things that will make people say, well, if he'll admit to this, how much more could he possibly be hiding? Uh, I don't know whether he's smart enough to make that work or not. All right, let's see. Other stories to share. Uh, where did I put this one? Um, there was, uh, I guess, another entry in the George Santos saga, thanks to Raw Story. And uh, Travis Geddes brings us this latest one just today. What's being revealed here? Revealed! George Santos got shady campaign cash, that much we knew, this time from an Italian person of some kind, an Italian busted for smuggling undocumented migrants, which I think most Republicans think is a huge crime, right? Rep uh, representative, and that's what he is now, George Santos could face new legal peril over donations from a confessed immigrant smuggler from Italy who has close ties to his campaign. The New York Republican accepted campaign contributions from Rocco uh -oh, uh, Opedisano, that's my best guess, who was expelled from the U.S. in January of 2019 and then arrested for piloting a yacht, of course, loaded with undocumented migrants and $200,000 in cash toward Florida. And the donations are almost certainly illegal, reported the Daily Beast. Santos appointed Ope de Sano's brother Joseph and niece Tina, who operate the upscale Queens restaurant Il Bacho, um, B A C C O, did they say Bacho that way or Baco? Bacho? El Bacho to his, uh, he appointed him to his Small Businesses for Santos Coalition. And his two campaigns spent $25,443.64 at the eatery since running for Congress in 2020, the first time, and his most recent campaign reported owing Il Bacho uh, $18,773.54, i give you the exact total, for its 2022 election night party. Ah, so that's even where he chose to have his election night party. Interesting. Legal experts noted that more than a half dozen of those expenses marked food and beverage were suspiciously reported at $199.99, which is exactly one penny below the threshold that would have required them to hold on to receipts of the transaction. That's very interesting. So rather than have receipts, um, just we, you know, we're going to pay for our catering that night in a series of $199.99 charges, which, uh, you know, sends up some red flags, let's say. You can't structure transfers of money in a way to intentionally get around the law, said Jordan Leibowitz, Communications Director for Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington. If someone was trying to structure a kind 
and was trying to structure it like this, I guess, and kind of lazy about it, this is kind of what it would look like. Yeah, it's exactly what it would look like. Opa DeSano himself gave $500 to the Santos campaign on September 22nd, 2022, despite having his permanent resident status taken away after a bust in 2009 for firearms, pills, and cocaine at homes belonging to Joseph Opa DeSano who told the Daily Beast he had introduced his brother to the congressman, but insisted he could not recall whether he encouraged the donation. However, FEC records show Joseph Opadisano and another brother had donated the same amount on the same day, just days after Santos established his small business coalition. There are some things on which there is no gray area with the FEC, and one of them is donations from foreign nationals, Leibowitz said. Santos connected political committees also spent thousands of dollars at, uh, or I guess other committees also spent thousands of dollars at Il Bacho, including, uh, well, we'll just say $4,500 spent on meals and fundraising expenses by Rise New York PAC. That would be the, uh, the leadership PAC, which is run by his campaign treasurer and his sister and $2,500 from the account of a failed state Senate candidate who worked with a firm Redstone strategies with links to the congressman. So, all right, that's the end of the article. But I guess more stories pouring in daily about George Santos and where he's getting his financing and the weirdos that he's connected to, including, uh, yeah, someone busted for immigrant smuggling. That doesn't look good, but, you know, they're not going to do anything about it. So that's that's kind of that. These, these uh, allegations will just pile up and there won't be much to do about them. All right. Here is, uh, well, let's see, what other fun stories? I'm going to scan back through some of the older ones and uh, hmm, see what we've got. Uh, let's see, uh, maybe, all right, one or two things here that we ought to uh, bring to your attention. Let's try and uh, get in a couple of these. Uh, hmm, how about this one? Um, maybe to uh, raise your spirits about, uh, if that's even possible at this point, about uh, investigations ongoing at the Justice Department that we might be tempted to lose faith in because of how long they're taking, given uh, uh, similar to the story we heard from out of Georgia today. Though now we know the explanation for why there were no indictments. It's still, you know, an awfully long process. What do we know about this on the federal level? The feds say, according to NBC News, that they're in for the long haul on the January 6th investigation. But there is a time limit. You should know about that. The Justice Department's probe into the Capitol attack is entering its third year with hundreds more arrests in the pipeline. So I guess it could still be happening. Ryan Riley, who has uh, done a tremendous job reporting on this whole episode, uh, adds this to his collection in the two years since a mob of Donald Trump supporters stormed the U.S. Capitol, violently assaulting dozens of officers, inflicting millions of dollars in damage and sending lawmakers scrambling like so that they didn't get murdered. We might as well just say that the FBI and the Justice Department have responded with a historic and sprawling investigation that has resulted in more than 900 arrests, nearly 500 guilty pleas, dozens of significant prison sentences and more seditious conspiracy convictions than the U.S. had seen in several decades. Still, the FBI has arrested just a small fraction of the more than 3,000 people who could be charged. At least 250 suspects wanted by the Bureau on accusations that they assaulted officers on January 6th are still at large, according to federal authorities, and as is the person who planted those pipe bombs outside the Democratic National Committee and Republican National Committee before the attack. Heading into the third year of the investigation, the pace of arrests has slowed dramatically, even as federal prosecutors have just three years left until the statute of limitations runs out on most January 6th offenses, in case you were wondering about that. And just as the Justice Department is set to get millions of additional dollars to fuel its investigation, it will also face scrutiny from a Republican-controlled House from members who have called to defund the FBI and who have heavily criticized the Justice Department's January 6th probe. 
the Justice Department did win substantial victories in the second year of its investigation into the unprecedented attempt to prevent the peaceful transition of power. Federal prosecutors secured more than 300 guilty pleas in a single year. Federal judges imposed nearly 300 sentences, including a record 10-year prison sentence for a retired New York City police officer who assaulted a Washington cop with a flagpole and then lied about his actions on the stand. The FBI made numerous key arrests, and it even arrested a GOP candidate for governor who said it helped who it says helped destroy property on January 6th. I don't know if I even remember that one. And the Justice Department won multiple convictions in a major trial against members of the far-right Oath Keepers, including two for seditious conspiracy. Three other Oath Keepers pleaded guilty to seditious conspiracy as part of a plea deal. Uh, let me see about which uh, gubernatorial candidate was arrested. That was in Michigan. Uh, Ryan Kelly, uh, who had acknowledged being in D.C. for the protest that preceded the deadly Capitol riot. This was back in June of this past year. Republican candidate for governor in Michigan was arrested by the FBI and charged with misdemeanors Woo for his role in the U.S. Capitol riot. OK, but at least there was an arrest made uh, and running for office was no protection. But I'm sure he was just one of several Republicans still running at that point. All right. Jumping back to the current article, the federal investigation, though, has been strained, spread thin and strapped for resources as a sometimes less than agile federal bureaucracy adapts to the overwhelming scope of the caseload. That includes digging through a massive trove of digital evidence, much of it generated by rioters who extensively documented their criminal activities with their cell phones. The FBI is working its way through almost 4 million files, including more than 30,000 videos from body-worn cameras, surveillance cameras, and rioters' devices. For context, these files amount to over 9 terabytes of information. That's not good context. It doesn't help, <laughs> to be honest. And would take at least 361 days to view continuously. So you would, if you just 24-7 watch the video, it would take you a year to do it. The community of online investigators who have identified rioters and played a role in uh, rioters and played a role, yes, in hundreds of January 6th cases, meanwhile, say they have spent much of the last year on an emotional roller coaster. The sedition hunters, as they call themselves, have celebrated arrests they had waited on for months after having turned over information to the FBI, devoured new evidence from federal trials and the House January 6th committee that led to more identifications and investigative leads and marveled at the enormous impact their work has had in the case, in case after case. They have built a repository of content for more than 5,100 Facebook profiles, 1,400 YouTube accounts, 600 Instagram profiles, 1,600 Twitter feeds, nearly 200 Rumble accounts, and more than 900 TikTok profiles, according to one of the online investigators. The online investigators say they have positively identified hundreds of additional rioters, to the FBI who have not yet been arrested and that they are growing frustrated by the slowing pace of FBI arrests. More than 100 people featured on the FBI's Capital Violence webpage, which essentially functions as the most wanted list of riot suspects, have been identified by online investigators but have not yet been arrested by the Bureau. Three sources close to the investigation said... In addition, online sleuths have positively identified more than 600 people who entered the Capitol on January 6th and have not been arrested, the sources said. Hundreds of those names, as NBC News has reported, are in the FBI's possession. While the FBI arrested more than 700 defendants in the first year of the investigation, it arrested about 200 in the second. The Justice Department has chosen to focus its resources on people who either entered the Capitol or committed violence on or property damage outside, not on the thousands of demonstrators who simply passed barricades and entered the restricted grounds of the Capitol. The FBI has arrested more than 900 people, but the total number of January 6th participants who could be charged under that paragraph is much is more than 3,000, according to the database compiled by sleuths. Some of these sleuths are perplexed by what they see as a lack of prioritization at the Bureau, gritting their teeth as rioters that have watched violently, that they watched violently assaulting 
law enforcement officers on social media and surveillance video go on vacations and attend family weddings and spend yet another holiday home with their families without facing consequences. The list of not yet arrested January 6th participants whom the open source investigators say they have identified after either spotting them inside the Capitol or engaged in violence or destruction outside includes veterans, people featured in adult entertainment videos, a funeral home director, the niece of a famous comedian, a corrections officer, an elected official in Connecticut who has since admitted to having entered the Capitol. There's a link for that one. A celebrity photo collector who has had his image snapped with Rihanna, Selena Gomez, and Kim Kardashian. A man who flashed a gun at the Capitol and then fatally stabbed a 19-year-old man in a park in Salt Lake City. A male model. A former police officer. A real estate agent. Uh, There are several of those, I think. An ex-NFL player. Not like the one who got elected here in Virginia. A race car driver, a neurosurgeon, a stand-up comic who was featured on America's Got Talent. America's Got Indictments should be the next version of that one. And a man previously arrested for playing a musical instrument naked in public. That's quite a collection, I must admit. At least two people who were featured on the FBI list died before they were arrested. I guess I can accept that, as did at least two other people who went inside the building, according to the sleuths. Others, uncharged uh, as January 6th participants identified by the sleuths, have been arrested on other charges, including a man who was arrested for walking around his neighborhood sans pants. I guess that's a popular infraction for these guys. The clock is ticking. The statute of limitations for most federal crimes is five years, meaning most capital attack defendants would have to be charged by January 6th, 2020. Federal authorities tried to make it clear this week that they are in this for the long haul. In the months and years to come, the FBI Washington field office will continue to partner with the U.S. attorney's offices across the country to bring to justice those who attempted to use violence to substitute their will over the will of the people. David Sundberg, assistant director in charge of the FBI's Washington field office, said in his statement, well, we'll see how they fare against the six, five years that they've got. You have been listening to Kegro in the morning with David Waldman. I recommend if you've got time to take a look at the balance of that NBC News article. There's a great little rogues gallery of people that are still waiting on either identifying or seeing arrested. Uh, you might have an interest in reviewing that. In the meantime, stay tuned next for the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy uh, podcast. Not a live show. Still waiting on that new computer.